Good afternoon. Thanks so much for having me. I've been tasked with discussing everything you need to know about TNT and watch and wait in 12 minutes. So we're going to jump right in. I have no disclosures. Just to start with some definitions that I'm sure we don't need, but so that we're all on the same page. TNT or total neoadjuvant therapy refers to systemic chemotherapy and short course radiation or chemo radiation given prior to surgical resection, um, or in some cases, non-operative management date, uh, based on response. It can be given in one of two general forms. We can begin systemic chemotherapy prior to chemo radiation or short course radiation. We call that induction chemotherapy. Or we can give chemo radiation or short course radiation first and follow that with systemic chemotherapy. We call that consolidation chemotherapy. Watch and wait or non-operative management for the purposes of this talk refers to intentional organ preservation strategies based on a good response to new adjuvant treatment. We're not focused here on the patients who refuse surgery or otherwise are not physically a fit to undergo surgery. Let's start by talking about TNT. As many of you know, the NCCN guidelines at this point, every patient with locally advanced rectal cancer is a candidate for TNT. But this is from back in 2015. Dr. Fernandez Martos, who was the PI of um, the GCR3 trial, talked about the fact that until that time, we really had no compelling evidence for systemic chemotherapy in the management of rectal cancer. We have included it in our NCCN guidelines dating back 20 years, largely extrapolated from the colon cancer trials. There were really no randomized trials that suggested that adjuvant chemotherapy or chemotherapy at all for rectal cancer led to any meaningful survival benefit. But there was always this lingering question of, well, are we not seeing a benefit for, in terms of survival from chemotherapy because the patients aren't tolerating the treatment? We know how difficult it is to get through adjuvant chemotherapy after undergoing proctectomy, especially with a diversion. And so we, they wanted to test out this idea of the benefit of um, neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy or what we now call TNT. So this was the trial. Patients were randomized to a standard of care of chemo radiation followed by surgery and then adjuvant chemotherapy as compared to induction chemotherapy with KPOX, followed by chemo radiation and then surgery. This was a phase two study and what they were looking at was the PCR as sort of a surrogate of response and how well we're treating the tumor. It included all locally advanced rectal cancers within 12 centimeters of the anal verge. What they found was actually no difference between the induction chemotherapy arm and the standard of care arm in terms of PCR or any of their survival outcomes. But they did prove what they sought to uh, prove to some degree, which is that 91% of patients in the TNT arm were able to complete their full treatment as compared to 54% of patients in the standard arm. And that was largely driven by an increased ri uh, risk of adverse events in patients who got adjuvant chemotherapy. Not a surprise. Others around the same time started to ask this idea of can we increase, can we improve outcomes if we give uh, TNT as compared to standard of care? This is the very famous, and I'm sure most are in the audience are familiar with the Rapido trial. They randomized patients to a standard of care consisting of chemo radiation, followed by surgery, followed by adjuvant chemotherapy, which was dependent on the institution, right? They did not mandate adjuvant chemotherapy. Or patients were randomized to a short course radiation arm, followed by consolidation chemotherapy, right? This is chemotherapy after radiation in a TNT context, followed by surgery. Importantly, these were high-risk tumors, not all comers in terms of locally advanced rectal cancer, advanced T stage, advanced N stage, or other high-risk features. The primary outcome of the study was disease-related treatment failure. That was not the original uh, primary outcome of the study, but it was changed uh, during the analysis or during the, uh, the collection of the data. And it is defined as the first occurrence of any um, local regional failure, dysmetastasis, new primary tumor, or treatment-related death. I think the most important thing to understand about Rapido and sort of its impact on our thinking for TNT is we should note how differently these two arms were treated, right? The standard of care arm received chemo radiation, the experimental arm, short course radiation. We also talked about the fact that adjuvant chemotherapy in the standard of care arm was optional. And in fact, just under half or 50% of patients who went through the standard of care arm were even offered adjuvant chemotherapy after surgery. And of those that were offered, it 66% completed the treatment. This is obviously markedly different than the patients who received chemotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting where 85% of them completed their chemotherapy. These are their findings. So essentially, they showed a statistically significant, do I have a pointer here? I'm not sure. Yeah, oh great, there we go. Um, they showed a statistically significant difference in terms of their primary outcome, which was that disease-related treatment failure with a statistically significant p-value. Um, they also showed an improvement in terms of dysmetastases, 
Um, and at the time of their original publication, no difference in terms of local regional failures. I think the most important thing to really look at in these survival curves are when they split. If you pay close attention, the main difference in, diff uh, in terms of disease-related treatment failures and in terms of the metastases is within the first six months of randomization, right? These are patients who are developing failures of metastatic disease essentially during their treatment, okay? After that, the curves largely become parallel. They found no differences in overall survival, um, and they found no differences in disease-free survival in patients who underwent an R0 resection. They did find, as we, as we kind of know uh, increasingly now, um, a difference in the PCR rate. So for patients who underwent TNT, consolidation P TNT that is in this case, 28% PCR rate as compared to 14%. Rapido then published a long-term follow-up. And in this long-term follow-up, what we saw was a continued benefit in terms of distant metastases, in terms of their primary outcome of, of disease-related treatment failures. But importantly, they noted that there was actually an increased risk of local regional recurrence after TNT, after their TNT experimental arm, and that was statistically significant. They tried to understand why that would be, and in uh, multivariable analysis, looking at uh, just based off of baseline um, uh, sort of features of these patients, they found that TNT was associated with an increased risk of local regional failure after an R0 or R1 resection as were in large uh, lateral pelvic lymph nodes. And then when they went and they looked at, well, let's look at the surgical pathology, what factors from surgical pathology can uh, predict these recurrences, what they found was that TNT was again associated. But very importantly, they found a significantly higher risk of intraoperative breaching of the mesorectum in patients who had undergone TNT, in patients who had undergone short course as compared to long course chemoradiation. So really interesting findings. Pradige published around the same time uh, also looked at this idea of TNT versus a standard of care. They used an induction TNT strategy, specifically fulfirinox, not the standard what we would consider fulfox, followed by chemoradiation, surgery, and some additional adjuvant chemotherapy as compared to a standard of care. And this was one of the first times that we ever saw, really, in a clinical trial, in a randomized trial, a difference in disease-free survival based off of something to do with chemotherapy and rectal cancer. And that's what's highlighted here this was the original publication of Pradige showing an improvement in disease-free survival for the patients who underwent the TNT arm. No differences in overall survival, but also an improvement in internal metastases. Again, note that the main difference between these curves is happening very early on, within the first six months, if less than a year, so when patients are on treatment. They found no difference in the baseline characteristics of these patients. Again, they found that TNT leads to higher rates of PCR. This is the follow-up, the long-term follow-up of Pradige, which has only been shown so far at ASCO GI. The publication is not out yet. I think the important thing to highlight here is that they showed statistically significant differences in terms of disease-free survival, metastasis-free survival, overall survival, cancer-specific survival, using something called RMST. This is, not a this is not even the type of analysis that they used at the first publication. This is a specific type of statistical analysis used given that they saw some differences in how the curves were uh, behaving on, Cox on what we would tra what we con uh, consider traditional statistical methodology. But nonetheless, they found these really impressive results. Um, overall survival, 75 to 76% in the experimental arm. Lastly, I'll just present the German because I think it's interesting to think that at the Around this time, Prodige is using induction, Rapido is using consolidation. The Germans got together and said, well, which one's better, right? So let's test induction versus consolidation. We're going to use oxaliplatin with the chemo radiation. We're going to basically keep the radiation, the, the type of radiation the patients are getting relatively the same. The primary endpoint of the study was PCR. And what they found is that the PCR rate in the consolidation group, 25% as compared to 17% induction which is quite similar to what the Spanish trial had originally shown, actually. And when you looked at the combined PCR and CCR rates, so patients that underwent watch and wait because a couple of them were allowed to undergo watch and wait, and the PCR rates, 28 and 21%. So in summary, if we're talking about the evidence for TNT, overall survival, Pradige suggests that there's a benefit in the long-term analysis for overall survival. Disease-free survival, again, Pradige metastasis-free survival, both Pradige and Rapido to some degree uh, have shown that there seems to be an improvement in metastasis-free survival, but again, a lot of the events that split those curves happening early on. Rapido, importantly, showed this concern for an increase in local failures after resection. 
understanding, again, that the two arms got very different treatments in the neoadjuvant setting, at least in terms of radiation. But one thing that we can all agree on and everyone agrees on is that you probably increase the PCR rate with TNT. And we've shown that in multiple studies at this point. And so let's move on now. I was also tasked with talking about everything you need to know for watch and wait. And I think that's a natural segue into it because what we've learned about TNT is that it probably helps us get to a clinical complete response. I don't need to explain the rationale for watch and wait, I think to an audience of surgeons who have to take care of these patients after they've undergone proctectomy. Um, clearly better uh, functional outcomes for patients, better um, BFI subscale scores for patients who have a watch and wait as compared to even sphincter preserving TME. And so I'll present the OPRA trial because that's probably the best quality data that we have at this point for non-operative management. As everyone in the room probably knows, patients were randomized to one of two TNT arms, right? They were not randomized to watch and wait versus surgery. That, does, that data does not exist. They are randomized to either uh, induction chemotherapy versus consolidation chemotherapy. They were reassessed at four plus or minus eight, or eight plus or minus four weeks after the end of treatment, regardless of which arm they came from. And anybody with a clinical complete response or a near complete response was offered the possibility of non-operative management. Um, it did not meet its primary endpoint. Its primary endpoint was actually compared to a historical arm treated with a standard of care, looking at a difference of 75 to 85% in terms of disease-free survival. It did not meet that. In fact, the arms were quite similar. Um, and that's what's shown here. But we did show, um, and as everyone's quite familiar with, the, the probability of preserving the rectum, of having successful non-operative management, very high in both arms. Um, it was just around 53% and 41%. I think it's important to compare that and to put that in context into all those prior trials that were looking at PCR, right? The PCR rates for Apito, the highest, best performing 28%, 28%, 28% for patients getting to TNT. And here we are talking about preserving the rectum in nearly 50% of patients. So how is that different? Um, how did we get to that difference in OPRA? And I think it's important to really focus on the fact that patients were offered non-operative management uh, if they had a clinical complete response or a near complete response. And that about 75% of patients from each arm entered non-operative management. And it speaks to the idea that in order to maximize non-operative management or the possibility of non-operative management, we need to give people time. We need to give time for the response uh, to develop. I'm really short on time. This is just a highlight that people are really interested in sort of maximizing watch and wait. This is the Janus trial looking to take what we learned from Pradige about the possibility of using fulfirinox in the neoadjuvant setting to optimize uh, the possibility of watch and wait. Also, people are asking the question, do we even need to give oxaliplatin? We know the toxicity associated with that. Can we get to non-operative management with just 5 uh, fu leucovorin? The fundamentals of watch and wait, and I'll just take a little bit more time, is just um, two, cre two critical things. You need to have a standard criteria for assessment, right? That's the only way to get a majority of patients into a watch and wait program is if we can all agree about what a near complete response and a clinical complete response looks like. And these are the um, criteria from OPRA. And very importantly, we need to watch people closely because obviously we have to salvage them if regrowths happen. Um, and we have to remind ourselves that there actually is no randomized data comparing watch and wait and TME for locally advanced rectal cancer. And so that leaves us with this lingering question of, is it safe? Um, I could probably end it here. Sorry, I had just two more slides, but I'll just focus on the fact that from OPRA, we, they had, we had split up the responses at the time of restaging. Clinical complete responders, near complete responders, incomplete responders. These patients all went to TME. These patients all did worse in many of the survival outcomes. Not to be um, surprised, of course, these patients obviously have the most aggressive biology. The clinical complete responders did very well. The near complete responders were in the middle. They did not do as well as the clinical complete responders. And that leaves us with the question, did we miss an opportunity? Had we operated on these patients at the time of restaging with only a near complete response, without a clinical complete response, would we have prevented metastases? Would we have pro um, prolonged life? And this is a sort of unanswered question, a very interesting abstract presented at ASCO this year that we hope to see the paper published soon, suggesting that perhaps these patients do run some risk when we offer them non-operative management, the near complete response patients. So as a summary to this, very important to have good criteria. We have to follow people. We have to give people a chance to respond, right? Operating on everybody, even with a pretty good response, but without having a perfect response, we're not gonna get people to successful watch and wait. We have to remember that there's no randomized data. 
And we have to really think about where does TNT and watch and wait live within the context of all of the different treatment paradigms that we have for rectal cancer. Do we really believe that TNT increases overall survival in a population based off of essentially just prodige, assuming that a substantial proportion of patients with locally advanced rectal cancers might achieve a clinical complete response, may have really good biology to just radiation or chemo alone. And that's what we've learned from Prospect, for instance. And more importantly, what is quality of life and what are we aiming for? Is watch and wait always the answer? Thank you so much.